This is your last chance. After this, there's no going back. Take the blue pill. You wake up tomorrow in your bed, and you'll continue to believe whatever you want to believe. Take the red pill, and you stay in Wonderland. And I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And it'll also clear your sinuses. It's got epinephrine in it, it's good for that. But it'll make you drowsy, so don't operate heavy machinery. And no drinking. Daniel Ball, MLP Luigi, David Wendell, and Ryan G all asked, can you do a video about the simulation hypothesis? The simulation hypothesis is a really interesting subject, but before I get into any specifics, I want to show off my patented new woo-woo alarm. This is mostly a thought exercise. It's good for a fun discussion, but don't be calling me a loon and saying all kinds of weird things about me because I'm just sharing this with you. The simulation hypothesis runs into some of the same issues that religions run into in the sense that they're unfalsifiable. In science circles, unfalsifiable means that it can't be proven or disproven. Doesn't mean it's not real, just means that we can't prove it's real. At least we're not capable of proving it or disproving it with our current understanding and technologies. So let's establish really quickly what simulation hypothesis is, what it means, and who's behind it. Most people credit the simulation hypothesis to Nick Bostrom, a philosopher and theoretical physicist from the University of Phoenix. <laughs> Wait, did I say University of Phoenix? I meant Oxford. Oxford. Bostrom published a paper in 2003 in which he postulated that at least one of the following three statements must be true. One, the human species is very likely to go extinct before reaching a post-human stage. Two, any post-human civilization is extremely unlikely to run a significant number of simulations of their evolutionary history or variations thereof. Or three, we are almost certainly living in a computer simulation. In other words, given the exponential growth in our computer power, unless we manage to go extinct, we will eventually be able to run ancestor simulations that are indistinguishable from reality. The only question then becomes, will we do it or won't we? Which leads us to the first reason why you might be living in a computer simulation. We're already doing it. Online virtual worlds like Minecraft, World of Warcraft, and Grand Theft Auto are already creating virtual spaces where people like you and I can communicate back and forth with each other, obviously on much smaller scales than the universe that we know of. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Some of our biggest supercomputers have been used to create simulations of, you know, the evolution of the universe and viral outbreaks and emergency planning and the weather and stuff like that. It's really not hard to imagine a future where computers can handle the ability to create billions of conscious entities and the, the people of that time maybe hit a crisis point and do simulations to figure out what went wrong. Does anybody else feel like they're watching us right now and going, oh, Donald Trump. Of course, today when scientists run these simulations, they don't just do one simulation, they do multiple simulations with different variables to see what the results would be. It's not crazy to imagine that someday post-humans would do the same thing, creating basically multiple universes. Reason number two. The Fermi Paradox. Yes, our old friend the Fermi Paradox, which asks the question, why do we seem to be alone in this ridiculously huge universe? As the comments to my original Fermi Paradox video have shown, there's no end to the answers of this question, but one of those answers has to be that there are no aliens because all this is just a computer simulation. There is an idea put forth by Robert Lanza called biocentrism, which basically says that the universe is created by our own consciousness. In other words, when we took the Hubble Deep Field photograph that revealed thousands of galaxies in a tiny sliver of space that we didn't know were there, those galaxies didn't exist until we looked at them. Much like the photons in the double slit experiment, uh, only exist in potentialities of waveforms until we look at it, the rest of the universe grows as we observe it because our observations make it real. This also brings up something called the anthropic principle, which says that the universe must be compatible with the conscious beings that observe it. And there's two types of these. The strong anthropic principle says that the universe is compelled to create something to observe itself. In other words, it was designed fundamentally to create life. And the weak anthropic principle states that the universe must be fine-tuned either by a programmer or the program itself in order to meet the needs of the conscious beings inside of it. Like creating more space and universe as we look out into it. Just vast, empty, lifeless space because it's all part of a simulation. Reason number three, glitches in the matrix. In the movie The Matrix, they famously described phenomena like deja vu as glitches in the matrix, a way to show that something in the matrix had changed. Oh, deja vu. What is it? A deja vu is usually a glitch in the matrix. It happens when they change something. 
it was usually a bad thing. But we've all had experiences like that where you walk into a room you've never been before but you totally feel like you've been there when you think about a loved one or a friend and then suddenly the phone rings or you look across the room and you see somebody and then you glance away and look back and they're not there anymore. Most of these scenarios can be explained by coincidence or just your mind playing tricks on you but what if it was something else? Paranormal phenomena have been described since the beginning of recorded history. They've been chalked up to ghosts, angels, demons, aliens, uh, psychic re residual energies, wormholes to other dimensions, the list goes on and on. Or maybe they're glitches, like we've seen in video games. There's an entire subreddit on this topic, and some of these stories are actually pretty compelling. One Redditor explains that when she's sleeping, oftentimes her family will see her in other rooms of the house, and sometimes she'll just disappear completely. One guy described a recurring dream that he's had his whole life, and then one day he went to a party and saw paintings around the house that perfectly depicted these dreams that he'd always had. One describes a time when some teenagers were holding a tailgating party outside of this kid's house, and as he was looking out the window, he moved to the other side of the window to get a better view, and the entire party just disappeared. Believe it or not. Reason number four, compromises in simulation algorithms. Who doesn't love a good optical illusion? They're fun, right? Well, the only reason the optical illusions work is because our brain takes shortcuts. This is how our visual field works. It's just too hard to take in all the information all the time, so our brain has created these built-in little algorithms that makes most of our spatial understanding go on autopilot. It's all about saving power. Optical illusions play off of that shortcut by creating incongruence between the object that we're looking at and the context surrounding it. Similarly, there's an incongruence in our universe between the physics of the very small, quantum mechanics, and the physics of the very large, general relativity. In other words, atoms and subatomic particles act completely different than things like stars and galaxies. For the past 100 years, with all the advancements in our understanding and our technology, we have still been unable to combine these two theories. Why would the universe have two different sets of realities? Some have said this is a good argument for the simulation hypothesis. The reason why we have two different realities is because that's what the simulation needs. One of the more popular theories that's tried to combine the quantum and relativistic worlds is called superstring theory, which leads us to our fifth and final reason why you might be living in a computer simulation. Computer code in superstring theory equations. Here's where it gets really weird. Professor James Gates is a theoretical physicist and a leading proponent of superstring theory. He got his PhD from MIT as a professor at the University of Maryland and was given the National Medal of Science and serves on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. I tell you all this before we go forward just so that you know that this isn't just some crackpot with a website or something. This dude's legit. And this dude, while cranking away on his string theory equations, found computer code. Computer code that seems to be embedded into the fabric of our universe. And this isn't just a random bit of ones and zeros either. This is a specific type of code called block linear self-dual error correcting code, or BLISTEC for short. It's a common bit of code in web browsers that allows a computer to send and receive information and allows it to self-adjust in order to correct for errors. Now, if that makes your brain melt, you're in good company. Neil deGrasse Tyson almost couldn't stand up when he first heard this. But some people argue that this type of code actually shows up in a lot of different types of mathematics, like sphere packings, lattices, reflection codes, octonions, you know, those things. So in case your brain has not been sufficiently turned to mush yet, here's a few other little mind-blowing thoughts about all this. If we are living in an ancestral simulation that's been created by a future civilization, then you are the ancestor of your own creator. You are God's great, 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 great grandparent. A creator who his or herself would have no idea whether or not they were in a simulation. And think about a couple of centuries down the line when we're able to create these types of simulations with conscious beings that have no idea that they're in a simulation. How deep does this thing go? It's simulations all the way down. So as I said in the beginning, this is really more of a thought experiment. Don't take any of this too seriously. Don't go out and run in front of a train because you know the simulation will save you. It will not. Because even if we were living in a simulation, what would change? You'd still have to eat, you'd still have to go to work, you'd still have to be a decent human being. It's not like all the rules of life just go flying out the window. From the beginning of time, we have always been a species that has not trusted that reality is what we perceive it to be, that there's something deeper going on. Where does that come from? Is that something unique in our special brains that causes us to think that way? Or was it programmed into us? The choice is yours. Now this is a very high level look at this whole thing. Really each one of these reasons could be an entire video into itself. But I'm going to include all kinds of links and stuff in the description below. So have at it in the comments. What are the arguments against this being a simulation? Do you think the simulation argument has merit? Or do you think it's a load of crap? Discuss.
And after looking at that Reddit page, I have to say I'm really curious about this whole glitches in the matrix thing. Have any of you had any experiences that you just cannot explain? Things that maybe you don't tell anybody because you think they'll all think you're crazy? As always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if it blew your mind, share it with other people and blow their minds as well. This is your first time here. I hope I earned to subscribe because I come back with this kind of stuff every Monday. Thanks as always for watching. You guys go out and have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next time. Love you guys. Take care.